This is Coons Ford Turf Talk with Bruce Posner. 60 minutes of Maryland athletics and your phone calls at 410-481-1300. Now, here's Bruce Posner and Turp Talk. Hey, welcome, in everybody, to uh, a good Wednesday afternoon. Maryland Terrapin lacrosse is up, I think, 8-2. to two. Uh, Logan Wisnowskis from uh, Boys Latin is just tearing them up. But we'll get a, a quick report from Wayne in about 15 minutes or so, and then we'll have Todd to recap the game afterwards. I uh, had to miss it today because the show's on the air. And right now, the the real hot topic of the day is the University of Maryland men's basketball if, after finally a win on the road against Northwestern. To discuss all things Maryland hoops, my good buddy from Press Box, Luke Jackson. Luke, welcome in. Thanks for having me. Always my pleasure, Luke. All right, Luke, I gave you some homework assignment. We all know, the whole my whole listening audience knows, that if Maryland wins the Big Ten tournament, they're in automatic. It's an automatic bid. But what I want to know, and what I, I'll give you my opinion after I hear yours, what can Maryland do to get in at large, or can they at this point? I think they would have a shot if they got to the Big Ten championship game, uh, even if they lost that game, because that would mean that they would have beaten Michigan at home, which is would be a solid win. They would win their first Big Ten tournament game uh, next Thursday, and then they would uh, like I believe they would play Michigan State that Friday at noon. Uh, and then it would yet to be determined who they would play on that Saturday, but it would probably be a very good team, and that would be a win that would help them towards uh, getting into the tournament. Uh, I think that might might be enough, uh, but again, I think, like you said, I think the only surefire way that they can get into the tournament at this point uh, is to win the Big Ten tournament because they just don't have very many quality wins. Yeah, I understand this new tier thing where it's uh... – you know, A or Group 1, Group 2, and I understand they're 0 and 9 against Group 1, which doesn't bode well. But if they would win against Michigan, which would be a Tier 1 win because Michigan's in the top 20. Right. And then uh, take care of business in the first game, which they should, and then upset Michigan State. That gives them three more wins. I think that would give them 22 wins. Right. And to me, you don't think that's enough. I, they just don't have very many quality wins right now. I don't know if they're all that close at this moment. I, I just think that they ha- have a lot of work ahead of them because, like you said, uh, they, I, as far as those Quadrant 1 wins that you're talking about, I think they, only have, they don't have any Quadrant 1 wins, uh, which is that new uh, – the, the new – sort of thing that they're looking at, the committee is supposedly going to look at. I don't know if anyone really knows how much they're going to look at this new quadrant system or if this is just something that they're introducing and they're going to look at a bit because, like you said, you, there are quadrant one wins, quadrant two wins, quadrant three wins, and quadrant four wins, um, and they're, they don't really rank really well on anything in terms of the RPI. Now, if they look at the more advanced metrics, then I think they would have a shot because they do rank 36 on Ken Palm because of all those close losses, and their offense has been pretty solid all year. That's why they rank fairly high on Ken Palm, higher than their record would suggest. Uh, but they just have that one top 50 RPI win, uh, and that's against Butler. Uh, but again, on Ken Palm, they do rank a little bit better in that regard because they do have those two top 25 Ken Palm wins, and they could add another one. Uh, against Michigan, but again, I don't know if the committee looks at Ken Palm at all. Um, you know, this year is kind of the reverse of what it's been in the past, where Maryland doesn't rank as highly on Ken Palm as you would think, just based on their record and based on the quality wins. Um, you know, maybe this is <laughs> this is the year that Maryland fans want Ken Palm and the advanced metrics to have a little more say. But usually, it comes down to RPI, and they just don't have very many quality wins right now. Uh, it's really. They have the, the Butler win at home, uh, and they have the Penn State win at home. Uh, you know, and, again, both of those wins uh, are at Xfinity Center. So I'm not – they're just – their resume, as far as the RPI is concerned and the quality wins are concerned, it's just a little light. There's nothing there there. That's the problem. You know, it's funny. I hear, you know, well, Nebraska on the bubble. Holy cow, Nebraska is – what are they, 12-5? and five? How in the world can they be on the bubble? 
They're pretty soft 12 and 5 though. They uh, they've they had some pretty good luck with the conference schedule uh and from what I remember their non-conference schedule wasn't great. Now correct me if I'm wrong on that. No, but, it wasn't. But um they had like single plays against Purdue if I'm not mistaken. I think they had single play against Michigan State, single play against Ohio State. I do think that they played Michigan twice if I'm not mistaken. So, um that they did play a good team twice, but otherwise they just really haven't just didn't get a whole lot of opportunities in conference play to get those big wins and but they do get to play Penn State uh, I believe on Sunday and that's going to be a big game for both teams because both of those teams are on the bubble I like Penn State to get into the tournament and get that fifth bid in the Big Ten more than Nebraska right now because number one I just think they're a better basketball team I think all the numbers show that and, and number two they do have uh, better wins. They beat Ohio State twice. Uh, they have a chance to beat Michigan uh, tonight, so that would be another big win for them. And their their bad loss in non this is Penn State. Uh, their bad loss was against Ryder in the uh, non conference schedule, and that do- one doesn't look nearly as bad as it did when it occurred. Let's get back to Monday night. We'll talk about good things. Did that game not feel like it was for a, a championship or something for Maryland? I, I, the game just had a feel about it where it was like really important for Maryland to win and to get over that uh, losing streak where uh, the seven-game road losing streak, I, I thought it was crucial, especially going into a neutral venue next week. Right, right. And you really did want to see them uh, finally come out on top on the road because it's not like they haven't been playing hard. I mean, you know, Turgeon, after every game, after every road game, has said, has said, you know, my guys are battling, my guys are battling. And it, there's really only been one road game where you felt like they didn't play as hard as they could have, and that was against Ohio State. All these other games, all these other games on the road, it's basically been the same script over and over again where they're just like that one Justin Jackson short or they're with that, those two or three plays short uh, that could have been made maybe by Justin Jackson. So, uh, and it was, so it was good to see them finally get over the hump on the road. Uh, I'm not too sure what happened to Northwestern, but um, you know they, their season kind of has fell apart here towards the end, uh, obviously losing a 27-point uh, uh, lead at home against Michigan State was not great for their season. No, it was not. And I, Well, look, they're missing Bryant McIntosh, and I thought that Turgeon took advantage of that by going to that like soft full-court press. Right. He got some turnovers out of that. He kind of threw them out of their game. They really looked bad from the moment he went into that. And uh, But let's face it, Maryland wins that game for two reasons. Michael Sikowski and Deion Wiley. Yep. I mean, if we could get that kind of play out of them every game. I mean, Sikowski was playing like almost possessed there early on, and it was a big difference. You know, it's just these minutes are just uh, adding up on every everybody, and... We just have to get performances out of them, especially with that, you know, if to have any hope, you got to play three days in a row. Well, they, they've been having trouble putting two good games back together, especially when they're not at Maryland. If they were at Maryland, right. it'd be another ball game, but it's right. not. And I, I agree on you with uh, Michael Tchaikovsky and Dion Wiley because they got 40 good minutes out of the center spot against Northwestern between Bruno and and Tchaikovsky, both of them played well. And when they both play well from that spot, that's a lot to, for opponents to handle because most opponents don't have uh, those two centers to match up with those guys when they're both playing well. Obviously, a team like Purdue does, but most teams don't. And then when Deion Wiley is shooting well and Daryl Morsell is doing some other things like getting rebounds, uh, defending well, dishing out assists, they can sort of recreate what Justin Jackson provided when he was healthy. When Deion shoots well, Daryl does some other things well. They can sort of recreate his production. Yeah, listen, here's something I don't even want to talk about, but I'm going to. Are they a lock for the NIT even? Yes, I think so. Well, on the basis of? Well, I mean, they, I mean, they do have a lot of wins, basically. Um, and, again, they do rate fairly well on the advanced metrics. Uh, but uh, you're a team that's gonna, that might go 9-9 nine and nine in the Big Ten, uh, which even if the Big Ten is down, uh, that's – uh, I think that gets you into the NIT. But I was thinking about that today, but I think they would be solid, solidly in. 
And, but I don't know if they'll have any home games in the NIT because I think the women will have home games in the uh, NCAA tournament, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think at this point they're better off probably without home games in the NIT because yeah. I'm not sure what the attendance would be. Uh, talk about change the subject a little bit here. Were you at all surprised to see the NCAA reject the appeal from Louisville and now Louisville has to vacate three years of wins and the national championship and six hundred thousand dollars that's about as tough as it gets isn't it in today's world right i mean i wasn't surprised by that at all uh i was i'm curious to hear what you think about that but yeah i mean it, it just seemed for the past few months that that's the way it was going to head what do you think yeah well i'll tell you this much as uh pen makes it nine to four it's getting a little queasy there but uh what bothers me, I mean, what they did with the prostitutes is unconscionable. But paying off guys to go there, there were some guys Maryland lost to Louisville over the years. And guys who had committed, one guy, I can't remember his name in particular, he was a six, six eleven guy who was a real bust when he eventually got to Louisville. But uh, all of a sudden, these guys are getting 100 grand here and 100 grand there, and it bothers me. You know, a team like that should not have championships on their level if that was part of the way they got the players. And it sure seems like it was. Yeah, I don't know. But, yeah, it's, it's, it is it's kind of silly taking the banners down. To me, I mean, the games happened. I mean, we all saw them happen. Uh, they, they won that. I don't know. It just, it's, a, it's a little silly uh, to go back in time and try to like, erase that history to me. But, I don't know, maybe it's more symbolic. Well, it's, it's, it's really symbolic because the uh, fan base doesn't take well to it. You follow me? Yeah. And uh, we'll see. Let's go back to Sunday, Michigan Maryland certainly can beat Michigan. They had him beat before the controversial yep. play when they didn't guard the throw in and all that stuff. We won't go into that. I think that subject's been killed. But uh, I, I'm looking forward to seeing them defeat Michigan. And I don't view it as an upset. And I think the line of that game will be close to picking. What's your take? Yeah, I mean, Michigan's been playing really well, uh, as most John Beeline teams uh, do. They, they play well in, in, uh, in February, heading into March. And, of course, like I said before, they'll play tonight at Penn State. Uh, and if they can get that win, that'll be another uh, good win for them. And they're obviously comfortably in the tournament. Uh, they're a really good defensive team. They're a better defensive team this year than they've been in a while. And that's sort of been their calling card this year, which is odd because you, usually those Michigan teams play that really efficient, slow style of offense. That's not really them this year. They're, they've been a really good defensive team. But the key player for them is Mo Wagner, of course, of course. because he is such a t- Tough matchup for really any center in the Big Ten because of how, how skilled he is, how well he shoots. He almost shoots 40% from three point range. That's going to be tough to guard. Uh, and he can take it to the hoop as well. So that's tough to guard, too. I mean, you've got an almost seven foot center that can shoot and put it on the floor a little bit. I mean, that's tough. And then they've, but they've got some other good players as well. Uh, Abdur Rahman, who was the guy who made the big play uh, off the inbounds pass against Maryland uh, to win that game. He's a good player. Uh, and they've got some good younger guys, too. Uh, Poole and Livers, uh, who played well, I believe, uh, have played well throughout this year. So they would have been really, really interesting had DJ Wilson come back. But obviously he went uh, pro, and I think he's been in the G League all year. But if he, had he come back, they would have been really, really interesting. You know what? Everybody's had their injuries. You look at Northwestern, it seems like they, what are they dressing, eight guys? I mean, it's almost impossible with dressing eight guys, but that's what they had against Maryland the other day. And uh, so, you know, the injury thing, you just can't excuse that. But I like the fact that it's senior day. I like the fact it's Checo's last game and Jared Nickens' last game. And I think Checo, Checo's kind of like gotten the wake-up call lately. Now, you never know which Checo shows up. In fact, I wasn't sure he was wearing 15 the other night. All right. I think he's just healthy now because he did miss some time with that injured heel, and it seemed like Turgeon was easing him back into the rotation. And then the other night against Northwestern is really when he played a lot for the first time since coming back off that injury. So maybe he's just feeling healthy now. Yeah, I, I hope so. I'm looking for that win. Are you going up to New York next week? No. Okay. I'm not. 
I will be there. Wouldn't miss it. Uh, hey, you can always go like on Sunday if they make it. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It's an easy trip. But uh, I want to thank you for calling in. It's always great having you on. Luke, tell everybody where they can find you on Twitter and uh, on Pressbox. Well, you can find my stuff at PressboxOnline.com. That's PressboxOnline.com. And you can find me on Twitter at Luke underscore Jackson 10, and I'll be tweeting with Bruce. All right. Well, hey, always great having you on, Luke. We'll see you on Saturday. Will do. All right. From, uh, from Luke, we're going to go out to Wayne Viner, who's at the game right now. And we'll get a – Wayne, are you there? Is he there? Wayne, are you there? Maryland Stadium. Right. Uh, 10-4 Turks. Logan Wisnowskis has had a heck of a first half here. And Maryland scored on nine of their first 11 shots on goal. Wow. So there's about 5.45 to go in the third. Uh, Penn's got a couple this half. But Maryland's defense has really kept them out of the middle. And you have the return of Corley, Young, both playing today. And uh, Maryland's been winning the time of possession. Doing fairly well at the X overall. A pretty good game. It's just not put away yet. I'm watching a little BTN to go, but not closely, obviously, because I'm on the air. But Logan was now, what's he got, four goals? He's got four goals. Uh, when he touches the ball near the crease, he scores. And most of them, because Maryland was able to keep the ball in these possessions and work it around, and they really just helped work the Penn defense. And, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, Kelly doesn't have anything yet, which is hard to believe. No, it sort of looks like somewhat of his night off. But fan favorites like Adam DeMello have scored. Uh, Bernhardt has two with a couple of assists. There are two power player or extra man goals in a row near the end of the second quarter where it was uh, Bernhardt. Two was now it looks a lot like Colin Hecox and Matt Rambo, really. Yeah, They're not uh, the same body types, but the chemistry's there. Have you seen a difference with Corley back in? Early on, I saw some turnovers that were strictly because of Corley. Not Corley, uh, not Corley Bryce Young. Right. Bryce Young comes back. Uh, he wears 41, Corley 42. And then the other defenseman who's had a lot of time out there is Jake Welding, who's a sophomore, Jack Welding. Uh, look, these are top-tier defenses. Maryland's known for putting top-tier defenses out there year after year. This group of three looks to have a, a shot at being as good as, as always, I'd say, for Maryland. But you know, better than I do, Bruce. Yeah. 10-4, to 4, I'm happy with that. Uh, it's a good team, number 17 in the country. They beat Michigan last week. Uh, and, uh, you know, keep keep winning. That's the bottom line. They got 10 days off till Notre Dame, which I happen to like a lot. All right? So the, that's bad, but it's a long way off, Bruce. Yeah, I, and Notre Dame's played us well every time out. They always play us well. It's always a low-scoring game, and it's always a battle. But I'll take my chances at home against anybody. And so Maryland's just got to hold on here. I tell you, with the way Maryland's been playing, it seems like they let teams back in when you think it's over. You know? So when it was 9-2 to two and they gave up two quickies, I started to worry a little bit. But uh, but those were goals from the outside. They weren't really breakdowns. So Dan Morris got screened, and the, both of them barely got in there. So you get more concerned when Maryland lets people get all the way to the crease and score. That isn't what's going on right here. I expect Maryland to hold on and beat the number 17 Penn Quakers. All right, real quick, that, real quick before I let you go because we're out of time, I had a talk with Luke Jackson before you came on. You know, I, th- I believe two wins, I beat Michigan and beat Michigan State. And I think it puts us on the bubble. He says it's going to take three wins to be in the tournament. Okay. I'm going to go with two and the two wins. But that third game, which would be on Saturday, Maryland has to be in the game. If Maryland can win all these games and get to Saturday at Madison Square Garden, if they lose by 20, it didn't matter if they won the game. So I'll go with two and a good showing on Saturday. against what I expect to be Ohio State or Michigan. They're going to be tough games. Yeah, but if you can number seventeen or nineteen, Michigan, and number two, Michigan State, you got a chance to get it. Beat Michigan State's the tall task, though. Let's be real; uh, it's a tall well, task because the matchup is so bad. Yes, 
and the matchup is bad because you end up with Daryl Morsell, a power forward, either covering uh, Ward or covering uh, is it Bridges. It's just an impossible matchup for Maryland. They need to have to play Checo and Bruno Fernando at the same time. Checo, over the past couple of games, has much more success when he comes in against the second team center. So we'll see how this goes. But no matter how it happens, you got to win these games, Bruce. All right, Wayne. Thanks a lot for checking in, and uh, we'll talk to you later on tonight. All righty. We'll see you on TurpTalk.com after the game. All right. This is Bruce Posner. You're uh, listening to Coons Ford Turp Talk here on CBS Sports Radio for the last 11 years. 11 years. Back in a few minutes here on 1300. Welcome back to Coons Ford Turp Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. Back on segment two, and before we get to Dennis, what about what happened to Oklahoma? Lost six games in a row. They're on the bubble. If that now, they figure out a way to stop Trey Young, and they just put way, way too much pressure uh, on the young man. And Oklahoma might not make the tournament after being in the top ten for part of the year. Incredible. On the phone right now, my good buddy from Coons Ford, Dennis Kalatsis. Dennis, welcome in. Bruce, thanks for having me on. Always a pleasure. Dennis, now let's pretend you're the agent for Kirk Cousins, and I'm the general manager for the New York Jets. Tell me why I should pay him $30 million a year. Because uh, if you want to compete right away versus uh, with a known commodity versus an unknown commodity, cause let's face it, all these rookie quarterbacks, any rookie for that matter, we never know how it's going to translate into the NFL. Plus, there's going to be a learning curve. Kirk Cousins is game ready. I think the team that should sign him are the Cleveland Browns. They have $110 million in cap space, Bruce. They have the first and their fourth overall draft picks in the draft, plus three seconds. They are loaded for bear. They just need a quarterback. And to me, for the Browns not to go after Kirk Cousins is insane. If you are not the general manager of the Cleveland Browns, we sign Kirk Cousins, and we get all those draft picks, plus all the great draft picks they have for the years, and we compete right away. Yeah, if you, you know, that's the thing. With a quarterback, with a freshman quarterback or rookie quarterback, you mm-hmm. just don't know what's going to happen. You really yeah, don't. You, yeah, you don't know if it's going to be Ryan Leaf or Peyton Manning. I mean, it, it, it is a, a, a toss-up, a crapshoot. You look at RG3 and, and, uh, and, and Andrew Luck. I mean, look, uh, RG3 flashed for a minute, and he faded, had some injury. Andrew Luck played well. Now he's injured, but there are no guarantees. That's what people don't understand about the, the NFL draft. As sexy as, it is, as sexy as it is and how we like to project these players in the future, it just doesn't always translate. Plus, as you correctly mentioned, there is a learning curve of at least a year, not to say two, Bruce, before the game slows down. You know, right here in Baltimore, Kyle Bowler, he had all the physical attributes, right? You know, big arm, you know, and, but the game never slowed down enough for, for him. And he never was a leader that, that he needed to be to lead that offense. So it doesn't always translate. Kirk Cousins, you know, the Broncos, the Jets, the Browns should be fighting over this guy. How about Minnesota? I mean, they got three quarterbacks, yeah. and, and they're looking at him. Well, Bruce, they say if you have two quarterbacks, you don't have one. Well, they have three quarterbacks that really don't have one. So you're right. All these contending teams that are so close and right there, they should give up the farm for a guy like Kirk Cousins and even Nick Foles, which I don't think the Eagles are going to let go unless somebody makes them a ridiculous offer. You know, let's talk about Nick Foles for a second. Everybody, the Eagles and everybody you know from Philly say, we're going to repeat next year. We're better. We're going to be stronger next year. We got two quarterbacks. And you know what that two quarterback thing does? You know that as good as uh, Carson Wentz is, and he'll be starting, when something happens, then all of a sudden people look to Foles, and then there's a division in the locker room. Oh. It always happens after a Super Bowl, uh, uh, Dennis. Well, the dynamics change, Bruce. You're right about that. They become the hunted. They're, they're, you know, they're circled in everybody's calendar, not just you know, on division with, uh, with the Giants and the Cowboys. Uh, but what, what the, the, the unique dynamic with uh, Nick Foles' injury, Bruce, is that – I'm sorry, not Nick Foles, but Carson Wentz's injury, he tore – Two of the three ligaments in the knee. He tore, tore the ACL and the MCL. He may miss the first four or five games of the season. For that reason alone, and the fact that Nick Foles is only going to cost him $7 million next year, I don't see how they let go of Nick Foles. 
No, 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 I agree. Unless he starts pulling a number and his agent tells him to hold out, you know what happens, what can happen. He's not, and he's not, he's not, he seems like such a good religious man. I believe he's going to become a priest once he gets out of football. He's an ultimate team guy. I don't see him pulling that stunt, Bruce. He's going to get paid anyway, whether it's this year or the following year. He'll get a big contract from somebody. I think he understands that. His agent understands that. He's the ultimate team player. Uh, they're very lucky to have him. All right, speaking of a, a, a gentleman who was going to be a priest or a pastor, we got Frank Reich, now the head coach of the Indianapolis Colts, who was the architect behind Philadelphia's offense. And the mere fact that you could change quarterbacks in midseason and win a Super Bowl, he had to be the hottest pros- prospector was out there, correct? Well, he was, and, 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 and Bruce, you know, you and I are, are big-time Ravens fans. We like John Harbaugh, but, but Frank Reich was my dark horse to replace John Harbaugh, you know, should John fail next year to get the team in the playoffs and with Eric DaCosta being the brand-new GM in that position and having the ability to pick his own uh, head coach, I thought Frank Wright the Baltimore was going to be a, a, a match made in heaven, if you will, a great offensive mind, gets his town energized. I think our loss is the closest gain. And I also feel bad for him because he couldn't pick the worst organization. You know, I still carry a big grudge against the Ursays. I think they're classless uh, from father to son. I'll never get over that, but anyway, I wish him all the best as, as, as a fellow uh, Maryland guy. Yeah, he was a great Maryland guy, engineered a great comeback against Miami, and also the great comeback yeah. for Buffalo. You remember that game? Uh, not a great professional career outside of the one game, but I have to tell you, his, his pedigree was strong, and there was a lot of talk about him. A lot of the ex-players from Maryland were kind of pushing Frank Reich uh, over DJ Durkin, but... Uh, Kevin Anderson chose DJ, but Frank Reich now, he's got quite an opportunity with or without Andrew Luck, but I'm, I sure believe they're going to be going after another quarterback as well. It's like you never yeah. have, you know, the quarterback. Then how about the Ravens now? Do, do the Ravens <laughs> do the Ravens take one in the first uh, in the first round? No, absolutely not. Uh, I, I think Steve Machado was genuine when he said that they don't need a quarterback. They owe, they owe Joe Flack with $50 million over the next two years. He's been relatively injury-free throughout his career. So I, I, don't, I can't see them wasting a high draft pick on a quarterback this year. Now, next year, when Joe will have basically one more year left in his contract, and in 2020, they'll be able to absorb an $8 million uh, salary cap bid if they choose to move away from him. So next year is when you draft a quarterback real high, Bruce. It's not going to be this year. I don't see anybody dropping to 16. And even if they did, they have so many other, other holes that in offensive line, wide receiver, as we know, tight end, free safety, inside linebacker. They truly have to go after the best player available at number 16, and they will not be a quarterback. Uh, we shall see. We shall see. I mean, the receivers are not overloaded. I mean, I'm not sure if it's going to be there, but with the Ravens, whatever, whoever they say they're looking at means nothing, and Ozzy is still at the helm for, yeah. for this particular draft, and uh, I guess we'll take it as it comes. But uh, well, well, first, the, the other thing is, with, you know, there's, as we talked about, you open up our segment saying there's no, short, there's no guarantee with the quarterbacks. There's no guarantee with any position player. Wide receivers, look, uh, I mean, you know, they, you know, they, some pan out, some don't. So just because they take a wide receiver at number, number 16 doesn't mean that the guy's going to come in and automatically give them, you know, 1,600 yards and 18 touchdowns either. Dennis, as somebody who follows the NBA, where do you see LeBron winding up next year? Oh, I think he'll be in the Lakers. I think the Lakers are positioned to, for, I think, one, maybe two max contracts and, They've got a young nucleus, and look, uh, Showtime, baby, in L.A., what about you? Uh, I think he's going to be a Cavalier. I don't think he's he's leaving. I think that the trades that they made were probably greatly influenced by him, and it seems like they made some good picks, and I just don't see him... I don't see him leaving. I wouldn't be shocked. And, of course, LeVar Ball said it's a done deal he's coming to L.A., and that's enough reason not to believe it. But uh, we shall see. Have you been watching any Olympics, Dennis? Bruce, when, uh, when there's nothing else to watch, I mean, admittedly, I'm not a big uh, Winter Olympics. I love the Summer Olympics, but if there's uh, some skiing going on, uh, I'll, I'll take a look at that, and that's about it. What about you? Yeah, disappointing. I love the alpine skiing. That's my favorite thing, yeah, yeah. and uh, disappointment in uh, Lindsey Vaughn and the American men so far in alpine skiing, where they really have, you know, uh, outside of Michaela Schifrin and LeBron's for Lindsey, they haven't won anything in Alpine. And tonight's another okay. shot from Michaela Schifrin in the combined. I'm not sure if Lindsey Vaughn's going to be in it, but uh, cross-country win for the women. I tell you, the women are doing unbelievable, Dennis. Uh, no, I like Schifrin. I mean, I think it's a great story with her mother there being her, her coach. So it's definitely a great storyline. 
a must-watch TV for sure. Tell me about the Echo Sport. I saw it, fell in love with it. What's your take on it? How are your early customers' reviews uh, on it? They're loving it, Bruce, and uh, the way to get that vehicle, there's a great lease deal on it. That's the way to go. That's where the big money is. So it's moving very, very fast. I have uh, 15 in stock, more than anybody else in the country, and I've got about 150 coming. It's going to be, it's going to be a great, great vehicle. I think it's going to replace the Ford Focus. I think it's just a, a taller SUV-ish type of a vehicle with great gas mileage. I just think that for the person who doesn't like to drive the big truck but still wants the four-wheel drive car, I think it's unbelievable. And price yeah, wise, price, yeah, yeah right. price it falls what between twenty and thirty loaded. I mean, unless you go yeah. crazy. But I looked at a few in your showroom, and they were like twenty nine grand, and there was not much else you could put on the car. Yeah, and I'm telling you, that lease deal is really sweet. Gets everybody a nice low payment and worry free driving. Uh, you know, you lease all your vehicles. I lease all of my personal vehicles. It's the way to get that vehicle. It's great. No doubt. And of course, add my car into your shop. I just gave you a stellar review. A stellar I review. I saw it. I can't thank you enough for it. Did you uh, sit? They I, showed I, it to you? No, I, I read them. I, I get them. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, you don't think I watch our reviews? I mean, that's look. That's the new word of mouth, Bruce. So we try to earn that, that great reputation, and uh, that's how we keep tabs on, on our customers and our employees. That we want to make sure everyone gets treated like Bruce Posner uh, at our store. I uh, got a, a email or a te- it was an email, I think, that Ford asked me if I would allow them to use that in the magazine. Yes. So yes. Oh, you saw that. So I did. I, I might make the magazine, Dennis. <laughs> Look, I see all the great ones and I see the, 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 the sparse and far few between not so great ones. And we, we address those too. We want to make sure everybody has a great experience, a world-class experience, whether it's sales, service, body shop parts, doesn't matter. We want all of our customers and friends to have a world-class experience, and I don't have to be there for you to get one either. You know, uh, we have great staff. You know, you're, you know I, I don't bother you. I talk to your staff. Your staff's unbelievable. Dennis. And uh, between, my, between my son and my daughter, there's always a colossal on the, sh- on the ship right now. Always, so, you know, always. We have family there. Always. always. Dennis, always great talking to you. Say hello to the family, and uh, we'll catch you tomorrow. Tell everybody where we can find you. I'm finally up the dollar. You know, you'll be a guest, and uh, we'll, we'll have NFL draft talk, Bruce. Uh, NFL combine next week, so I've been doing my homework. Right, and, of course, the Terps are up 10-4 to 4 today in the fourth period. I'll give you a little wrap-up of that after I get home and watch it tonight on the replay. And uh, off to a 4-0 start. That's what you would hey, expect. Go Terps. Go Coach Tillman. All right, my friend. Thanks a lot, Dennis. Thank you, Bruce. Be well. All right, this is Bruce Posner. Well, let's head out to our break. Uh, Back in a few minutes here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. We'll be approaching a final on the game out at College Park. Uh, We're going to have Todd also in to talk about women's basketball. The great start for Maryland baseball. Winning two out of three for Rob Vaughn with Taylor Bloom, their Friday night pitcher, pitching a seven-inning shutout uh, last Friday at Tennessee. Two and one at the Southeast Conference Tennessee Volunteers. Back in a few minutes here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. This is Coons Ford Term Talk. Call 410 481 1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. We've got good news coming out of College Park, and we'll bring in my good buddy Todd Carton, frequent member of Terp Talk of the Terp Talk game. Todd, how are you this afternoon? Having a good time with good news, Bruce. Yeah, give us a, you know, I just saw the, what's the name, Wisnowskis, who's playing, who's unconscious today, pick two guys for Connor Kelly. Did you catch that before you left the uh, room? Yeah, yeah, actually I did. And, and it's, fu- I, it's funny because I was just remarking that that's an unusual way for Kelly to score, um, to, to make that dodge from behind, even when he does get a pick. So, and then Wisnaskis just came down and uh, uh, scored again. So it's 13 to four right now. Holy cow. Thank you, John Desco. Are you asleep at the wheel? (laughs) This is a transfer from Syracuse, Todd. Yeah, I know. And he's, he's just been on fire. The the other two stories of the game tonight so far, Bruce, are, are Dan Morris, who has been just unconscious in goal. Uh, I think he's got about a, 10 or 11, maybe even a dozen saves, including a, an incredible save after he turned the ball over, trying to clear the ball to midfield, beat the, the, the 10 guy back to the goal, and made the save. 
Uh, yeah, what else? So, Sh- you going to tell me Shockey, I hope? Shock- Shockey is the other story, absolutely. This is the face-off um, kid. He's a freshman, and he's supposed to be on a Baptiste level. I mean, not yet, but he's supposed to be that kind of quality of a face-off kid. Yeah, and he came, he came in, I think, to start the second quarter, and, and Maryland uh, probably, uh, last I looked, they were, I think, 12 for 18 or 12 for 19. So he's, he's been doing a heck of a job uh, in his third game as a collegian. That's the other sto- big story tonight, I think. I know you rented a uh, skybox with three or four of your friends. I bet you are figuring it's a good investment so far. So far, it's been great. Uh, Wayne stopped by a, a few minutes ago and had him down. He had some chicken wings <laughs> and some meatballs and uh, whatever else we had and uh, enjoyed the weather. It's, you know, tonight it's great because you, you have that option to sit outside or inside. So tonight with the warm weather and the rain holding off, we can sit outside and enjoy the game or come inside and, and we get the, the the opportunity to see the replays too because we have two TVs in the suite. I want to pull you away from the game, but it is over. I mean, it's uh, 13 Yeah, to for all intents and purposes, right. it's, it's 13-4. It's, it's not any... Uh, and you know, and, um, unless something happened, no, still uh, three and a half, three minutes uh, to go. It's over. It's over. Let's talk about uh, the Lady Terps and uh, these last two losses that they've had. What, what's going wrong for them, Todd? Yeah, you know, Bruce, I, I, I've written about and, and talked about on air about how strong they were playing defensively, and they just look like they haven't had their legs under them defensively the last couple of games. And and partly when they went out to Minnesota, Minnesota had a freakishly good shooting game. You know, they, they, they shot at one point, they were 14 for 20 from three-point range. And then last night, Minnesota hosted Indiana. They were, I think, two for 18 or something from three-point range. Yeah. So, so it was one of the just kind of it was a combination. Uh, you know, we'll see if they can turn it around. I, I know that I, I was actually at practice today, and and Coach Fries was really focusing on on defending uh, and uh, Michigan, who they play tomorrow night, and that'll be a really big big game for Maryland on the road. It's a be a really quality win if they can pull that out, and would guarantee them a top four seed in the Big Ten tournament. Uh, they sure need it. And, of course, women's lacrosse, a big win down at Florida, 16-14, to in one of the dirtiest games. I've never seen a, play, a team play so dirty as Florida does. I, I, I don't even know why Kathy plays them. i tell you the truth. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Bruce. I, you know, they, they came up here last year. They got whistled for 55 fouls and nine yellow cards. Uh, this this past weekend they had another seven or eight. I don't remember. I don't have the stats in front of me. But it was it was just a high number. And frankly, watching the game, I thought there were two or three places where they could have gotten called for yellow cards that they didn't get whistled. Uh, so, no, I agree. I thought it was a. What they, I mean, it was it was just crazy. I think eventually they kind of wore Maryland down, or they beat them up. You know, and uh, I don't know. Maryland won 16-14. They're undefeated. They're number one in the nation. And we'll take it from at And they play at Carolina on Saturday. So, and Carolina is another top three, top five team. No rest for the weary, right? No rest for the weary. Kathy, Kathy does not back away from a challenge. She'll play, play anybody, of, anywhere. I accuse her of trying to lose a game. I really mean <laughs> that. I'd be going undefeated last year. And I just feel like... Uh, Somewhere she's making it so hard to stay undefeated. Uh, what a save by uh, Mars. Yeah, uh, just saw 13 to 5 with two minutes left. I spoke too soon because he just got stripped and they scored. Oh. <laughs> 13 to 6 with two minutes left. Uh, now, we can't let the night go, and we're almost out of time here. We can't let the night go without talking about Taylor Bloom and the uh, the great start for Rob Vaughn and the Terrapin 9 going to an SEC school. And I know they're not the powerhouse of the SEC, but every team in the SEC is good. And Maryland goes down to t- Tennessee and wins two out of three. How significant is that, uh, Todd? I think it's I think it's it's uh, significant. It's a great start for Taylor Bloom, who who won the Big Ten Pitcher of the Week uh, this week, and and it is and and you expected Bloom and Blom on Friday and Saturday to be solid. The Terps are at William and Mary tonight, 
And last I checked, they were losing, uh, I think, eight to three or eight to four. So it's it's that Sunday starter, midweek starter, and and sort of middle relief that's going to be the big question mark as we get into the season. But I think that by the time the end of the season rolls around, this could be a real quality win series win for Maryland on the road because Tennessee's a really young team, and and they were. They're, again, you're right. They're not the top of the SEC, but but they were had a solid record last year, and I, and were top 55, top 60 RPI team. Partly that comes from playing in the SEC. Yeah, and uh, Rob Vaughn, you know it's funny. Uh, everybody, when when John Chef left, I was pretty upset. First guy to call me, of course, is Todd, and he said, "Don't even think twice about it." He said, "This guy can really recruit." And then I got to meet him, and he's really a, a A type personality, Rob Vaughn. Yeah, he is. He's 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 great recruiter. He's he's really great at player development. I think he was he was a really good good promotional hire, promoting him up from assistant coach. Gives the program some continuity, and and I know the players love playing for him. Yeah, for sure. So uh, so Maryland. So the women play tomorrow at Michigan, correct? The women play tomorrow at Michigan and then finish up the regular season with senior day Sunday at noon against Nebraska at home. Right. And in your opinion, they need to win both to get that to ensure the two home games for the Sweet 16 leading up to the Sweet 16? Yeah, I, I think they do, Bruce. Uh, you know, I, I think that they had probably off the string of play leading into this little stretch where they've dropped to, they had probably moved themselves up to somewhere 11 or 12 and, and they've dropped down to 14 now. So, you know, they're the, clearly the, the committee is looking carefully at them at this point and they need the, these two wins. Uh, if they get them both, they'll have a share of the, of the big 10 title and they'll be the number one seed because it'll be Ohio state that they're tied with and they have the head to head against Ohio state. And uh, I'll get your opinion because I got Luke Jackson's from press box. I got Wayne and I had mine. What does Maryland have to do to make it at large? Win two in the Big Ten tournament or three? At least three. So you think they've got to get to the final game to have any chance for at large? I think so right now, yeah. Okay. I I just don't think two two is quite enough. You know, they, their their struggles on the road, their their lack of quali- really quality wins. Even though they have no bad losses, they also don't have any any real quality wins. And even if they pick up one uh, in the uh, semifinals of the the Big Ten tournament, I just don't think that that's quite enough. I think they're going to need to win at, at least three and get to the final. Right, get you're the talking if they got one in the quarterfinals against Michigan State. That's not enough. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I, I don't know. We'll see. They like to look at teams playing well at the end of the year. They'd be 9-9 and in conference. They'd have 22 wins. But uh, that's it. And the game's over. Todd, I thank you for taking a few minutes out of your time. It's 13-6 to was the final. Uh, 4-0 for the Terps. You can't do much yeah. better than that. I mean, that game last Saturday, uh, you and me were sick over. But, yes, sir. Uh, you know, it was just one of those things. You can't play perfect every game, and Maryland proved it last week. Todd, right. thanks a lot for checking in, and I assume we'll see you sometime over the weekend. Yep, I'm sure we will, Bruce. Thanks a lot. Take care. All Take right, terps. this is Bruce Posner. You've been listening to Coons for Turp Talk this Wednesday night and every Wednesday night. Reminder, Saturday, 9 a.m., Coons Ford presents the Sports Maven. We'll be on at 9 o'clock as always. Uh, we welcome you to join the show. A lot to talk about with Maryland. Big game on Saturday against Michigan. We'll preview that. And with that, we're going to sign off thanking uh, our super producer. Who's on first? Absolutely. All right. That'll do it for today. See you on Saturday morning at 9 a.m.